welcome to Pet Sitter Confessional. Today, we're brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. We are super excited to have Tracy Bisson, owner of Golden Dogs Adventure Company, on the show to talk about her journey into pet care, how she manages her memberships, and how she combats and deals with compassion fatigue and mental burnout through everything and how she connects with her clients as well. Tracy, super excited to have you on the show and get started with this. For those who aren't familiar with you and your work, could you tell us a little bit more about all that you do? Yeah, thanks, Colin. I appreciate it. Great to be here today. So as you mentioned, Golden Dog Adventure Company, which started about five years ago uh, off of a um, professional pet setting company that I started, which was It Takes a Village Pet Care. And I know we'll talk a little bit more about that journey. But what we have found, since it was such a unique model and booster of business for us, for our professional pet sitting company, is that we started um, uh, how teaching others how to start a dog walking club. And we have students all around the United States and in Canada, and we found that it's just a great outreach model to um, reach your community and boost business and uh, just connect with more people on another level. Well, and I, th- I think it's really interesting about your story there, Tracy, is that this is kind of a, a spinoff of that original pet sitting company. So how did you get started in the industry? Well, that's interesting um, because I was actually working full time in marketing. I was the director of marketing for a a local college here and I was sitting in my office. And at that time, I actually had never heard of a pet sitter before. So we when we found that there was such a thing, we were very happy. We needed to bring one in for ourselves. And he was having a great time with our dogs. He was sending pictures and, you know, talking about all of these events and um, adventures that they would have together. And I'd be sitting here in my office a a little bit frustrated that I could not be out there with my dogs. And, you know, I was about there two months and I decided to myself, you know, really life is too short. I wanted to spend more time with my dogs. I had originally gone to school and studied um, animals, wildlife management. um, And I knew someday I would circle back to that. And I was not happy at the job I was in. Um, I'm really not a good corporate uh, type. So that wasn't the position for me. And I decided, hey, I'm just going to quit this and packed up my stuff and headed home and decided that I was going to learn how to be a pet sitter. Um, My husband was a little concerned. (laughs) about what I was deciding to do. But um, yeah, that's, that's kind of how the journey started. Wow. Well, talk about that, that concern, because that is kind of a big leap to go from a corporate job, right? And then, and then go into pet sitting. I mean, what was, what was that transition like for you? Yeah, that was interesting, because I, I was making a good amount of money. But, you know, I've, I've had businesses most of my life, my, my first one, I started in 2000. And then when 9-11 hit, Um, I told myself at that point, I wouldn't look back. Uh, Unfortunately, I did look back. I decided, you know, because we had young kids, I wanted to go back into the workforce, get the benefits, get the health insurance, all that good stuff, the tuition reimbursement, because my kids, you know, would be going to college um, soon enough. And, uh, you know, after two months, I was like, is this really worth it, you know, to sacrifice my sanity? Uh, you know, I'm just not a good inside person. I wanted to be out. I wanted to be hiking with dogs, walking dogs. And um, because he seemed to be having so much fun with my dogs and additional research that I did on the pet sitting industry really showed it as a viable um, opportunity. So I, I I pointed my sights that way. So in the early days, you were, said you were running a, a pet sitting company. Were you, so you're offering the the multiple drop ins throughout the day, were you in overnights and stuff. How did you start to do that transition to the the dog walking side of that? Yeah. So in 2016, we started the company. It takes a village uh, pet care, and we grew it to 13 employees. And one day, one of my employees at her 30 day review was like, hey, wouldn't it be neat if we could just all get together after work and walk our dogs, maybe invite some of our clients to join us? And I thought that was a great idea because we were very focused on community as an organization. So I thought a little bit more about it, kind of she had planted that seed with me. And what it morphed into was what was originally called It Takes a Village Dog Walking Club. So we reached out not only to our team, but to clients and to local people in the community. And I would go into different Facebook communities and just, you know, plant a post to gauge interest. 
you know, we're thinking about starting this dog walking club. We're just curious if anybody would be interested. If yes, let me know. I'll put you on our email list. And I had hundreds of people expressing interest. And what interested me the most is or fascinated me the most was that nothing like this had been started in our area. There were plenty of adventures and events and unique outings for dogs and the same for humans, but nobody who had brought the two together. So that's what really started it off, uh, you know, and we're, we, we said, uh, hey, let's let's put this all together and let's see what we can do. It's a, it's an interesting concept because, again, you are you're you're walking with the owners there, too. Right. It's It's much more of a communal aspect, much more social kind of time that you have together. That's right. Yeah. And we didn't know, you know, if uh, people would commit to something like that. So we thought we'd throw a test event out there. We actually um, put it out in December, which can be one of the coldest months here in New Hampshire. And uh, it was up a mountain. So, you know, there, you know, now you have to get people who want to hike up a mountain in the snow (laughs) with their dogs. (laughs) And we actually had eight people showed up. And I was amazed that first group of people who came out and said, this sounds really interesting. Let's try it. So then starting in January, we threw out an official event, told a a charity to come along with us and talk about their business. And that's kind of what started it off. Why do you think people connect with this kind of thing so, so well? You know, I think the biggest draw is to nature, obviously. People don't spend enough time in nature. And granted, this was prior to COVID. um, And after COVID, there was a much bigger draw to nature. But I think that was the biggest thing. I think, um, you know, we tend to find a, a, a key a range, age range or demographic between 45 and 56 years old to, you know, maybe they're empty nesters or um, maybe their their partners just don't like to be out and about. And there was this group of women getting together and they're like, hey, let's give it a try. Yeah, it's it kind of scratching all these little itches. Cause I know sometimes, you know, we run a dog walking company and sure, it can be actually boring being out there by yourself if you like talking with others. If you're more of a social butterfly, that's one thing about this industry where it's so isolating. And so pet parents can feel that too. And so going, hey, would you like to meet other people, be involved in something? And yes, get out and enjoy time with your pet. Exactly. And that's uh, one of the focuses that we had. What we did, too, is we also brought in charitable partners quarterly and we created awareness of their missions. We helped raise funds um, for their goals and they would come and they would attend our events as well. They would talk about their companies. They would network with people. So that was a big draw there to the community and to helping uh, to give back. And then it really just grew from there. Um, You know, we we became New Hampshire Dog Walking Club shortly after that to kind of encompass the larger area that we were focusing on. Um, And once COVID, um, we were kind of in the safety period of COVID after that, um, we decided to close It Takes a Village Pet Care and focus solely on growing the dog walking club because we could reach a larger market and we could offer education on a grander scale. And that's really when it started to explode from that point. What was that decision like? I mean, you, you know, mentioned that you had to shut down the It Takes a Village pet sitting um, to, to then focus on the, the dog walking clubs. Was that an easy decision for you? Did you ever think, oh, maybe I can make both of these work at the same time? Yeah, great question. And uh, it was not an easy decision at all because we're very connected to our clients. Um, we have, you know, once you get connected to the pets, once you get connected to the people, it's really hard to make that decision and say goodbye and, you know, trust their care in someone else, which is what we did. We went out and sourced other pet sitters mm. um, that met our high level of criteria and we um, connected them with our clients and eventually um, sourced, uh, you know, all those, all those, cl- placed all those clients uh, with other pet sitters. And then, um, you know, what was interesting about the decision too, as hard as it was to make that decision, I knew that what was next for us for on a grander scale of how many more people we could help would be so much bigger than who we were helping now. I It was just kind of like that pull that I was having that said, you know, there's something else there for you. You need to figure out what's next. And so we we decided to take that leap of faith. Although what's interesting now, when I look back, I mean, it takes a village um, was very uh, profitable. And so to leave that model and have enough faith to follow this model um, it, you know, into uncharted territory because nobody had done it before and to try to figure out as we go, it was risky. Well, and especially, you know, if, if 
seeing how you really saw your identity as somebody who helps. Right. So because what I see there is like, oh, well, you were helping people with pet sitting, but we can also help people with this with this walking club. So it doesn't matter how we're helping as long as we get to help people. Right. We're kind of in the in our lane and where we're most comfortable. Yeah. And that's really always been a driving force for me. I find the older I get, the more I want to help, the more I want to give back, the more I want to connect people to community. Um, and try to be a leading example of that. Um, and that that was huge for us to go out, uh, find charitable partners, to um, connect with dog trainers and veterinarians and local pet stores and others who believed, you know, who had the same core values and beliefs that we did and bring everybody together on a collaborative platform and really look towards helping people and companies. But but you are running a business still, right? And so I think that's important to know here is is that it's still a business. So how how do how do your your memberships work, and what does it mean to be a client in in a dog walking club? Yeah, so that really needed to happen to be kind of that solid revenue source, ongoing uh, monthly and annually. Uh, so we put together, we did some brainstorming, we did some focus groups, um, we did uh, surveys, different things like that to figure out what that model should look like, what should it offer. And initially, when we rolled it out a couple of years ago, it was very different than what it is now, because hmm. we had to learn over the years what was sustainable for us. Um, so now we have that model for membership, we have a similar model for um, businesses and experts. And we've put that all together and just rolled out a really nice package of in-person events and um, online outreach education. But from my understanding of what, how the model works, it kind of reminded me of a lot like a like a Costco membership of you pay an annual membership and then you get discounted prices on the events and you get special perks that come back to you um, and that other people – may not have a membership, they could still buy tickets to events and such, but they'd be at a much higher price. Yeah, exactly. So that was the model that seemed to be the most sustainable, getting um, the discounts off the events, um, getting to purchase uh, additional tickets for special events for friends and family, being able to bring your kids at no charge, uh, member-only events that happen every month where only members attend. Um, We have them both in person and online. Um, outreach education, where you have um, access to our experts. We call it monthly pop-up talks. Uh, we have a monthly Ask the Expert series, as well as our Ask the Veterinarian series. Mm-hmm. We have um, discounts to our online store. We have uh, over 20 participating partners that give discounts to members like pet food and treats and supplies and dog trainer discounts, wineries, uh, all kinds of places that we've partnered with. So over the years, we've been able to put together a really nice package offering um, similar to kind of like you said, that Costco model. And what I really like about that is it's such a more of a holistic approach to this because I know a lot of people like the membership model is really like a lot of people struggle with how to do that. And I, I know one approach is, well, I'll just have it like a gym membership of they pay me 80 bucks a month and basically they can use me as much or as little as they'd like, but they're, they're a member there. But what that gets hard at is that's hard to scale because people are going to go, okay, no, I want you to come over three times a day or I want you to do you know, whatever that gets you. And so this idea of going, there's all these perks back here. You have to there's there's a, there's a paywall there in order to get access to all of those. And then there's a whole world of resources, education, community and help to a pet parent. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the model that you described, the gym membership, we actually tried that and it did mm-hmm. not work for us. Um it was our third iteration of a model that actually was sustainable, was scalable, but we tried it all. I mean, uh, during COVID, I actually studied under Stu McLaren and Amy Porterfield, who are pretty well known in the industry for digital courses, um, building memberships. And, you know, much of what they taught, I could learn from, but because our model was very different and nobody had tried it before, I really had to morph it and um, test it many times before I finally got to something uh, that would work. You know, fortunately, we got an idle loan during COVID, which gave me that option and that ability to to test it. 
because mm-hmm. I, I couldn't go to, you know, like when I was in the pet sitting business, I couldn't go to the pet sitting business down the, the way and say, oh, this is how they did it. And this is what they charge. And this is how it works. I had none of that. So I was yeah. building it from scratch, which I love because I really feel I have an entrepreneurial mindset, but it was difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so we've come a long way in five years. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, it takes the focus off of the the membership is about the dog walk, right? And I think that's really where that becomes really powerful of the membership isn't about the dog walk. It's about so much more to that and trying to find areas of value. Right? And then once you get some clients, get some people who are part of your members, then going to your corporate partners, then going to the experts and going, I, I've got a group of people over here, right? That that you would like to talk to and kind of selling, selling them on that of you've got a group that they can come and, and pour into, give resources and information. And it's beneficial to everybody in that. That's right. And I love that you said that it's so much more than dog walking because um, in a focus group, that's a couple of years ago, it's, that was a big thing that we discussed that they thought that the name dog walking club in the title of the company was a negative connotation because people were saying, well, why would I want to walk with pay to walk with you? I can walk my dog myself, you know, and it wasn't until that moment when members said, you know, we need to evolve to what comes next so that people understand that it's outreach education. It's, you know, networking with like-minded people. It's, social learning for yourself and for your dog. We were just so much more. And then that's when we evolved into Golden Dog Adventure Company. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of like if you had like a a, a self-checkout adventure club for the grocery store. Of like, why would I pay the grocery store to then get check out my own groceries? Like, that's a weird club to be a part of. But if I can be a, a member of a club that gets me resources, access discounts on food and toys and things like that, yeah, of the local community, because I know that's what you 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 work a lot on too, Tracy. Of of most of your partners are are very local, at least to the areas that you're serving. They're not you know larger corporations. I, I know you have some as well, but they're they serve your community. Yeah, they're starting to get wider and wider spread. Um, I mean, we have uh, many of the big independent food stores, uh, pet food stores in our area that are corporate partners. The the local mall. Um, a number of dog trainers. I think we have seven uh, dog training partners that subscribe to our core value uh, and beliefs. We've got an animal communicator, a veterinarian, a canine fitness expert, um, pet photographers, a number of different people who've just decided that we want to come together. We do events together, like many of them are joining me for a fundraiser that we have tonight um, with a best-selling author to raise funds for our charitable partners. Um, and it's just that that collaboration has been so rich for all of us, um, helping each other to share events, um, helping each other to give back to our communities and all of the unique ways that we do. We have the Doggy Olympics coming up this summer, and most of our partners are participating. They're hosting events at their locations. We actually have uh, 14 uh, events in 14 cities throughout New Hampshire. And it's it's just grown and morphed over the years as we've proven to our partners that we've got something here substantial that you can feel really good about being a part of and giving back, you know, multiple times. Yeah. It's, again, it's this, this two-stage thing of of you are providing value to your members by the relationship with the partners, by right. these events and stuff. You then can turn and provide value to your partners because of the kind of members that you have, right? I guarantee you that the members that are part of your dog walking club aren't your average run of the mill pet owners. I think I, I would I would just wager to guess that they're a bit more invested and involved in everything that goes on. <laughs> yeah, and you're absolutely right. I mean, we have done um, demographic and psychographic studies over the last three years um, to get that really key data so that we can truly, truly understand our target market. Because then that information, when we share it with partners, they can say, oh, yeah, that's exactly who I'm trying to reach as well. And then um, it's a no-brainer for on on each end at that point. So so again, the members, I just want to, to run through this down. That when you become a member, you get discounts on tickets to the events, the members-only events, discounts from partners, you get the online courses and things like that. And anything else that, that I'm missing there? There's a full video library that's been growing um, over the last five years that has over 60 hours of expert um, content 
mm. on nutrition, canine enrichment, um, pet parent well-being, lunch and learns, ask the veterinarian. Um, so that's it's like its own little Google search engine specifically with expertise in the pet industry. Yeah. And then um um, some special online things, um, like I know I had mentioned Ask the Expert, which is an opportunity to be in a Zoom session with our expert for that month, which is usually a dog trainer. So you get them, um, you get to ask them questions, uh, anything uh, that, you know, you know, relates to the dog training industry where, you know, those people can charge hundreds of dollars an hour. The members are getting that time with them. And then as part of that as well, they also get to hear about any special things coming up. If there's new events, if there's new partnerships, if there's new opportunities, um, anybody who uh, joins that Ask the Expert session gets to find out about that stuff uh, first. So it's kind of one of those little FOMO things. It's like, you know, I don't want to miss out (laughs) on any of the good stuff that's coming. So I'm going to join this session. So, Have you heard of Time to Pet? Susan the Pet Gal has this to say. Time to Pet has helped us grow exponentially. We believe the platform's features make us by far more professional than other companies who use conventional dashboards. They are the software gurus constantly developing and improving the platform based on user feedback. This decision was a good one. If you're looking for new pet saying software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show will save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. And what I love about the, the that video library and some of those courses that you mentioned, like you record that one time and then that's infinitely accessible from everybody. You can copy that for everybody who becomes a member. It doesn't cost you any more money to make that video, but that's a huge value add to the members as that library continues to grow. So they, they benefit from that. And again, it's a, man, I, as a pet owner, yeah, I get to go and meet up with other pet owners and go on these walks, but I mean, I don't have to worry about going to Google, right? Because that's a big, scary world. And I don't have to ask my next ne- you know, next door neighbor, Greg, about what's going on with my dog. I can go to where there's actually helpful information. Yeah, and it's a benefit to the partners, too, because now they're in this library of very specific curated topics and mm-hmm. experts. Um, and so we do drive a lot of business from the video library back to these uh, experts, um, you know, once – our members learn more about them. They want to do business with them. And it, I, you know, it's, it's really, it's great when a member comes to me and says, Oh, I listened to their, you know, X, Y, Z presentation in the library and I'd love to do business with them. Can you virtually connect me? And we do that all the time. And I love that. Well, and it, again, it, it just allows that, that bigger, bigger and broader community that those people can have access to where in, especially in the modern day and age too, a lot of people don't know their neighbor. Or they don't know somebody across the street. They don't maybe have a friend to go in and have these kind of connections with. And it's a great bonding point over, hey, look, you've got a dog. I've got a dog. We're all here to talk about pets and get, and help one another. Exactly. And and what what we found too, Colin, which I'm sure you're finding in your industry, especially since COVID, is there was a whole nother level of need with reactive dogs, dogs that were socially isolated during the COVID time. Um, and and we found a whole nother opportunity to service this market as well. Uh, I was going to bring this up because I was on your website and I was scrolling down and you actually have like this big stop sign. That's like, like it, it stops you while you're reading. And it's like, you may be thinking, you know, what about a reactive dog? Click here to learn more. And I thought this was just so brilliant, Tracy, because yes, this is all everything that we, you and I have talked about up to this point is social and get out there in big groups and walking and blah, blah, blah. And, and, and then, to know, oh, wait, what's this subsection that I can dive into? So how have you how have you reached out to and incorporated reactive dogs and those with more anxiety? Well, I have a reactive dog myself. She's 15 years old, and we've learned a lot from her because her reactivity was due to mistakes that we made early on in her socialization period. Mm. Um, you know, uh, we learned so much from our dogs, and, you know, I was not in the pet industry when uh, we had her. Um, We're very fortunate that she's still alive and we've learned as much as we have about her needs. But um, so, so much information out there about reactive dogs. And one of the things that we're finding is it's not as much the reactive dogs as the individual who is the lover or the guardian of that animal who has become socially isolated over the years and is not really sure how to 
make friends or go out and have a normal life. Um, how do I leave my dog at home? I can't have a pet sitter come in because my dog is aggressive or, you know, just a whole host of needs. So we've worked so hard over the last couple of years to do a number of different things from our online reactive uh, dog support groups, where we have extroverts come in and we talk about um, solutions to helping people live a more normal life and understanding their reactive dog, to things like working with our venue partners to make a safe and welcoming space. And I'll give you a great example. We worked with a meadery here in New Hampshire um, that had a great outdoor space off of a barn. It had um, like a, a roof over it. So we had tables set up underneath it. We had about 35 people with about five of the dogs were reactive. And what we had decided to do with them is we spaced out the tables and chairs so that there was room in between people and dogs. And then we set up hay bales and we set up barrels. So people with reactive dogs would comfortably sit at the barrels while their reactive dog would be lying behind the hay bale. Mm -hmm. They could still talk and have normal conversation with people while the dogs were comfortable behind the hay bales, not having any, you know, hard stares or anything like that. And so we, you know, with our partners, with our team, we've thought, okay, what are other ways that we can be even more welcoming to people with reactive dogs? And it's such a huge need right now. Well, and because a lot of those owners carry around shame, they they carry around embarrassment. They yeah. want to hide, right? They don't want to. They don't want to try. And because spaces aren't really, you know, beneficial to them, they're not welcoming. They're not open for them. So to know, oh my gosh, I can actually go out and ex have this experience. That's going to encourage them to try more, to dig more. It's going to deepen their relationship with their dog. Not that they don't love their dog already, right? But they can start seeing. Okay, here's how, here's a path forward, and I, I think that's really that first step that really gives a lot of help. And I also saw you have, um, you know, uh, I think bandanas and things like that that you can give dogs too to give more of like, hey, when you're here with us, these are what all these signs mean. I I love that idea. Yeah, we have our whole social colors. Uh, it started out originally with just yellow, and we would talk about, you know, dogs wearing yellow and what that meant and giving them additional space and asking before you would approach and a number of different things. But then it expanded beyond that because some people said to us, you know, my dog doesn't need yellow and my dog wants to make friends. Is there a color for that dog? So we brought on green and we bought, brought on blue for training and we brought on white for dogs with special diets. We brought on red um, for dogs that were a little bit more aggressive. Um, I think purple is for um, dogs that are blind. So just, you know, when we would educate about that, we have a sign that explains that. And people loved that. They loved the opportunity to be classified in in other ways. So that other people would know, oh, my dog does want to make friends or, you know, my dog doesn't necessarily need a bubble, but he is in training. So please, you know, ask before you would approach. So that was a big hit. That was something we rolled out this year. Uh, it also helps, too, that other members at those events also have that same education and that same exposure to stuff. It's a little difficult to throw a yellow handkerchief on your dog and go out to the local mall when nobody else knows what that means. Right? That's still kind of a scary, tense moment. And then we're having to say, oh, yellow means yellow means yellow means. But it also takes a lot of tension off when it's like, nope, everybody already knows what that means. And and if they've been involved, they've also gone through courses and training and talked with the experts so they know how to handle those situations, how to greet those kind of dogs. It really creates this environment of people want to, to, to attend because they know that that's where they and their dog are going to be accepted and treated well. Yeah. And, you know, we even took it a step beyond that, too, because – when we found that the ed there was education needed about the dogs, we found that there was a whole nother level with the handlers as well, needing to help build up their confidence and teaching them how to advocate for their dogs. So they have the ability to do that on our adventure so that hopefully if they are out on a trail by themselves, they're approached by a loose dog, they need to educate another handler, they have the confidence to do that, and they have the ease of tone to do that because it's very easy to snap and be like, Using some, you know, f bombs and other <laughs> nasties when well, you have a dog not. approaching your reactive dog. <laughs> so, do you have do you have different membership tiers, or is it a one membership gets you access to everything? We used to. Um, now it's just the one membership gives you access to everything. Yep. Okay. What, was it because of complications that you got cut rid of? You know, cut the different tiers, or you just wanted to make it simplified, or was it hard to track? Kind of. What was the thought process behind that? 
Yeah, some of it became a manual procedure with the technology we were using at the time. We have since um, upgraded our technology, and there is still another step um, that we need to partake for um, what comes next for technology, which we'll do in the fall. But primarily, the packages um, were created to work with the technology that we have. So, for instance, you know, we have people asking for family um, packages all the time, but we would have to track manually in our technology anybody else who was added onto that membership. In the next um, iteration of our technology, we won't have to. So we'll be able to, when our corporate partners come on, because one of the benefits they have is all of their employees, and if they're a charitable partner, all of their volunteers as well get free membership. So. We now will be able to import all of that information and they will all be able to have their own uh, membership with all of the benefits um, like everybody else. Now it's kind of a manual process. They have to ask us for their coupon discount so that they can buy their event. So again, it, it's all driven by the technology because again, um, the technology didn't really exist for what we're doing. and We're kind of customizing and morphing it as we go along. When you were doing those those focus groups and digging into that kind of thing, what was kind of, I don't know, if, did, did you test out different price points for those memberships? And how did you settle on exactly what you were going to end up charging? Yeah, we did. Um, <clears throat> what we ended up on is a combination of what people felt was manageable, um, a combination of what we had tested over the last couple of years. And a combination of what we thought the market would bear um, mm -hmm. and also what we needed to make to, you know, maintain a profit and um, be able to be sustainable and grow. So it was a combination of that. And then um, every year since um, going into next year, I don't think we will. We've raised our annual rate to a point that we it, it, it's kind of it's in that uncomfortable spot. So it's like people still pay it, but people think more about it. So that's when we know that's where we have to stay temporarily same okay. with our events we you know our events initially were free then they went to five dollars per event then they were seven then they were 14 and then they were 20 and then they were 25 it's like eventually we got to that point where we were getting a little bit of pushback so we knew that was the point that we needed to maintain to grow right and, and so what kind of discount do memberships get on those on those tickets because they, again they're not paying full price for those correct so um $25 is the member rate. And then depending on the type of event it, it, it is, uh, non-members pay $10 more or for special events, they pay $15 more. Mm. And, and, and again, I, you mentioned there of like, where is that pain point? Where does it start to become uncomfortable with the knowledge of, of we still have to make money off of this. And, and that can, from a business owner, I know that that can be a, an uncomfortable position to be in of going, we still need to make money to make this feasible and and pay off pay for you know there's a lot of expenses that go into this you mentioned the technology you know the, the event spaces usually don't come free and everything that's associated with those and and you still need to make a personal living off of this while also going where where is that line because if i push it way too far high nobody's going to buy these and i make exactly zero dollars but if i pay it way too cheap i'm still going to make zero dollars so there's there's got to be a happy medium <laughs> Yeah, and that was really, really hard, too, because, um, as I mentioned, we didn't have any other business models to look at. So it was a combination of just continually testing and really raising the bar for the quality of events that we put out there. That that was a big one. I mean, I'd like to think that if you asked any of our members in this area, you know, how would you explain um, a, an event? You know, I would hope that they would use words like inclusivity and welcoming and safe and positive. So we had to get to that level. But what we, you know... What, what we finally realized we were there was um, two years ago, uh, we had a, a doggy Easter egg hunt, and, and that was our third annual, I believe it was. And we put some pretty extreme pricing out there just to see. It, it was one of our most popular events. We sold out every year. But this year, what we did is we put together a VID package, which is very important dog. Nice. Um, nice. And we went out at $150 a ticket. You know, and it incorporated a whole experience. The um, uh, event was three hours and we sold out of that first with a waiting list. So I knew we had kind of reached that pinnacle of, you know, people really liking, loving our events. And, you know, it was a matter of us just getting as creative as we could and 
taking people to places where they never thought they could bring their dog. I mean, we have relationships with um, private partners, venues, businesses, places where you wouldn't be able to take your dog unless you're with our event. We're able to do things that people can't do unless they're with us. And that's that's when I knew we went, we had finally made it because um, people really look to us for those kind of unique experiences, not just an event, an experience where they can do this with their dog, who is like a family member to them. That's really who we cater to. And I love the, the language. You know, you've mentioned events, experiences, you know, you don't you, you sell tickets to get into these things. It is very much this, again, that it's so much more than a dog walk. It's 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 we're breaking the mold, our minds from that, our mindset of, well, uh, well, we're just going to show up and we're just going to walk together and I guess kind of talk awkwardly. No, right. There's <laughs> there's a lot more that goes into an event. And I think that's where that value really starts to come into play as we start to go, OK, if I were to put on an event where I'm going to get 15, 20, maybe more people there, what kind of stuff could I do? do for them? How could I treat them well and have them walk away going, that was amazing? Yeah. And we'll do things like icebreaker games too, because when you have a reactive dog, you can't necessarily parallel walk with somebody. You might have to, you know, be quite a distance depending on your dog's comfort level. So we'll, uh, sometimes in events, we'll just kind of sit and we'll be calm and relaxed in our space. We'll let the dogs observe. I've got this dice. Um, it's like these squishy dice I throw out and it has a bunch of different icebreaker questions on it. We'll throw it out and we'll pass the question around. And that um, is a nice break in between, say, a nice hike and a swim and going off to get ice cream now. So we've done things like that. We've done that at wineries. And they like that, too, because even though they're there with their reactive dog, they still get to meet people, learn about people and share about themselves. And those kind of things really help. I'm sure they cut down on turnover of clients, uh, because, again, when you mentioned of I want to give them something that they can't get anywhere else. All of a sudden that beca- that creates a stickiness to that person to go, oh, I I, I, I want to stay here because if I'm not a member, I, I can't do these things anymore. So it does create this, you mentioned FOMO earlier, but also just this, this is, there's, this is the only place for me and my dog. And that becomes a, a really special place for them. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we have her- had some turnover in the past primarily when we change our membership model because, you know, either people don't agree with it or um, the price point changes and and they just don't want to pay that. Um, We also lost a few members at the beginning of this year when we made a big decision to move into the positive um, force-free field with our events. So we no longer um, allow, um, well, we never allowed retractable leashes, but we also will not allow um, adversive training tools now because we found they were not being used correctly and mm-hmm. dogs were being hurt. People just really didn't understand. And there was a lack of understanding, you know, due to us just not putting the education out there. We all were sort of learning from our events that people felt they had to keep up with the pack. They weren't allowing their dogs to engage with nature and sniff. And they're just, you know, if they were wearing the wrong training tools, um, their dogs, you know, the the, the corrections that were happening um, were hurting the dogs and it was causing other problems and, you know, things that can happen down the road. So we had to we had to finally rise to the occasion and make the decision as um, the, the partners who were consulted with this decision uh, to move forward with um, teaching people about positive and force free and the long term effects of using um, adversive training tools. And that that started a whole fire, as you can imagine, in our community, which was which I was actually very happy about, because when you get people to talk, and I'm sure you know this, Colin, who are passionate to an extreme about their pets, about caring for their pets, about the welfare of their pets, then you get people started on a conversation, but you also get them listening and learning. And so what we really understood at that point is we have to meet people where they are. We have to give them the education that we feel that they need, and we have to help them make the decision that's right for them. Now, not everybody's going to follow in the in the way we feel training needs to go in the best um, science, uh, you know, related um, research. But uh, we feel that we can be an organization that can help to make a difference in helping people learn um, what we've experienced, what we've seen, the long-term effects. Um, and I'm not a professional dog trainer myself, but I really feel that we've surrounded ourselves with some of the best in the industry. 
Well, and again, it was important. It sounded like for you to go and make sure everybody was on board. So, I mean, was that a discussion that you had with with your partners, with your you know, with everybody involved, to make sure that they were okay with that transition that the that your company that the you know the club and membership was moving towards? Yeah, well, I had the uh, discussion with all of our seven dog training partners, and that's how we made the de- the decision. There, um, we mm-hmm. did have. One team member who left us, one, two partners that left us, and a couple of members that left. Um, and I, I knew forthright that would happen. But one of the things I've always learned in marketing, and I've been in marketing for over 30 years, is that you have to put out what you feel is best. You know, it's part of your brand. It's part of your outreach. And you will attract those people. So it's the same thing as a professional pet sitter. You may have to let some clients go because of the way they treat you or the way they treat your team members or they don't pay on time or whatever it might be. So you let them go and you put out what it is you want and you will attract those clients to you. And it was the same um, with this. We had to up our belief system. We had to really stand behind our core beliefs and values. And that was a big part of it. Our friends at Pet Perennials make it easy to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. They have this awesome direct-to-consumer gift model that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches our client or employee on our behalf. All gift packages include handwritten cards, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get well wishes and welcome new and rescued pets. Additionally, there are gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business gift perks account. to Unlock the all inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is used on an as need basis, there are no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchases. It's just easy. Learn more at pepperoneals.com, check out their business programs, or register for that free gift perks count using the link in the show notes. Yeah, especially knowing that, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we are trying to do our best for um, our clients, right? We want to make sure that they are getting the care that they need. And if it's something that we believe in, that we stand for, then we've got to make those hard decisions and know yep, I'm not going to be able to please everybody today, but that same day tomorrow, right? It's, it's, right. It's, it's, <laughs> well, and what was interesting, what came out of that was the opportunity for us to have listening sessions. So we actually put three Zoom listening sessions together and we said, no matter what your beliefs or thoughts are about dog training, we invite you to come and discuss this with us. Tell us what you know. Tell us what you think. Tell us what you've learned. Tell us what you'd like to see. And we collected all of that information We boiled it down. We came up with deliverables and questions, and then we put a dog training panel together to answer questions that had come out of those discussions. But what was really interesting is that people felt that they could come to this, not be judged and be heard. Um, because, you know, it's kind of like right wing, left wing, wing, um, if depending on your belief system with training, and we wanted to just bring those people together for a discussion. And, you know, if you think Republicans and Democrats, if you just bring them together for a discussion about what we all care about, and if we can somehow meet in the middle and provide the quality education to just help people learn and understand, um, that was just, that was huge to us. Um, and I really feel that people valued being able to be a part of such a supportive environment and have their understanding of, you know, dog training philosophies heard. Kind of hearing your story here, Tracy, you've been doing a lot of changes over the past several years and a lot of growth and experimenting and trial and error and testing and all this stuff. How is, have you ever had to deal with burnout, compassion, fatigue, or how do you keep going through those times? Yeah, burnout and compassion fatigue for me was really help it happening in the professional pet sitting industry because I can't not get close to our clients' pets. I, I mean, I, I'm sure every pet professional has that problem because they got into this industry because they love pets and it's hard not to bond with them. And when they would pass or get sick or have a seizure or whatever, it was very hard to to take yourself away from that. And so you're, you've got that compassion fatigue, and then you have the burnout because you always want to be there for your client. You're probably working weekends, you're working evenings, you're working mornings, you're working in the day unless you have a, a team that you're managing. And it's just, it's hard to say no. And I got to that point where, you know, we weren't taking vacations and uh, my dogs really weren't getting the quality walks and things that they needed. 
And I just, I wasn't in, I wasn't enjoying it as much as I used to. And I love animals so much that I didn't want to get to a place where I couldn't appreciate the work anymore. Mm. So that was another big step in morphing and evolving into Golden Dog Adventure Company, because now we have a very set schedule. Um, I I can hold events and different things whenever um, we need to, whether it's on the weekend or in the evening, I can take a week off and, you know, still have online education. So um, it helped with uh, that specifically, Um, even though we made the changes and we, you know, we changed from pet sitting to just dog walking and then we weren't doing it on weekends anymore. And then we did away with overnights and we were still profitable, but it just wasn't enough. And I needed to take that next step for us. And I I know there's kind of that whole set of transitions that um, pet professionals go through as they try to create a normal schedule for themselves. Um, It's kind of an ongoing struggle. Well, and I I can imagine that's even more of a struggle now because events, I'm sure those take a long time, right? And those aren't during normal nine to five business hours kind of thing. So what's it been like for you balancing that? Yeah, it hasn't been as bad because, you know, once we got to a place where we finally understood how our process works, it, you know, it was a process of writing down those processes and then teaching them to uh, team members. And we've had several team members now with us for several years um, who will now lead those events. You know, we've got our safety protocols. We've got our process on what happens. We call them adventure guides. Um, based on the number of people who attend an adventure, will um, determine how many adventure guides are needed. And so the whole process was created. And so we could now put these people safely in the field with their training and their pet fair, pet um, first aid CPR training and allow them to run these events and, and just grow that model. And that has been successful. So are you reaching out into other communities around you to try and get these set up or kind of how are you, what's the, what's the growth strategy there for your business? Yeah. So we do service uh, several communities and we're actually in, we've held held events in four States, Um, New England, the States are relatively small. So we uh, service Northern Massachusetts um, from uh, the middle of Concord over to the seacoast, excuse me, the middle of New Hampshire, which is Concord. That's our capital over to the seacoast and then Southern Maine. And we've also held um, events in Vermont. But uh, it's been finding team members strategically in these different locations who know the trails, who know um, the different business partners, who can hold events in those areas. And then what we'll do is as we place team members in different areas, we will schedule events in those areas. And as we were doing that, we were finding more and more members were coming up out of Massachusetts because there was nothing down there. So we've since gone into Essex County in Massachusetts holding events down there so that we can have coverage in the areas that we're drawing the most membership from. So it's kind of this, where are people, where's, where's their interest? And then going, okay, how do we feasibly make this work? Do we have the support down there? Does that take, does that mean you reaching out to more partners down there? Or are you going to your existing partners and talking about, you know, how they can, you know, that, that kind of growth that you're having? Yeah. So we've, as we've expanded more into Massachusetts, we have more Southern New Hampshire partners. Um, We, uh, for instance, there's a company I'm talking to in the lakes region of New Hampshire, but we're not, we don't have penetration up there yet. So I'm like, let's kind of use you as an anchor. Let's try doing some events and different things together. Like we're doing a doggy Olympics event together. Um, and let's see if we can get penetration up there. So a lot of times what we'll do is we'll kind of pick those companies that we feel have the same core beliefs and values, start a relationship that way. And then as we get penetration in that area, we'll talk about a formal partnership. Um, and then that is, you know, kind of like in, in a in a mall setting, you've got your anchor stores. Yeah. We would have our anchors in these different areas, which have allowed us to expand to different uh, counties within New Hampshire. Yeah, relying on those partnerships who then have their own local connections, who have their own avenues to to see where, again, where that interest is. Because the kind of people that you're going after, you know, it doesn't sound like, and maybe this gets into more of like just what the market is like uh, by you, because you know, this, would you say that you have a a crowded market around you for pet care services? But, you know, I guess we've already kind of talked about how you're not really, it's not really about the walk. So this is a great way that you've been able to step up, step to the side from, from that area. 
Well, one of the things that we found is the market is definitely saturated here for pet care professionals, um, primarily pet sitters and dog walkers. And when we first got into the industry back in 2016, it was just really taking hold um, here. And it has grown unbelievably, and uh, especially since COVID. And what concerns me is the fact that it's an unregulated industry like dog training. Anybody could become a pet sitter. Um, they may may or may not have insurance. They may or may not have pet care, um, first aid, CPR. They may or may not be certified through PSI or NAPS. Um, and people don't know the difference. You just hope that who you're hiring is coming in and doing a good job. So because of that, there's so, so many of them. And I feel like I exited the industry at a really good time when it was getting saturated and people were undercutting each other with their pricing and moved towards something else that could help just elevate the industry, could educate about pet sitters and dog walkers and safety and certifications and licenses. So I feel that we're kind of, you know, we've connected with a number of pet sitters and dog walkers and we kind of offer them opportunities through networking, associate partnerships, things like that, um, if they are along the lines of the same core beliefs and values that we are. Yeah, because, you know, with the service that you're offering, it doesn't supplant or take away the need for that. You you know, you may have a, a member who also has a dog walker who, you know, does, you know, three or four days a week, but they personally want to take their dog to these events and they personally want to get access to that. So it's a great way of, of uh, example of how the in, in you, you know, a lot of people think of how, how many slices of the pie, like, well, you just grew the pie, right? You just went, nope, there's more opportunity here to serve people in a different way and stop worrying about how thin of a slice can I get out of this particular area by just making a whole new opportunity for yourself and for your members. Yeah. And, and based on, you know, the success that we've had growing this model that was virtually unknown uh, five years ago, we've been able to work with pet sitters and dog walking companies and other pet pros uh, around the country to teach them this model. Um, we have a great um, mini guide at our website that teaches them our step-by-step -step, uh, model. It's a seven-step life cycle um, that teaches them how to start it, how to start the Facebook group, how to get interest, how to monetize it, how to attract partners, because um, we really feel giving that information back is going to help people deal with compassion fatigue and the burnout that they potentially are experiencing. Or if they just want, if they feel the pull to to do do something bigger or there's a call there and they know that they can reach more people with with something more or they they want to give back to their community, but they're just not sure how. Um, this model has been um, tested and tried many times, and we hope that others will do it um, so that we can hear the success that's going on throughout. Yeah, I, I, I hear a lot of, of business owners say, I don't know if my, play, my where I live is a really dog place. I don't know if it's really, I don't know if there's much of a community here, so I don't really know what to do or what that looks like. And to hear kind of, you know, your own experience with this and, you know, kind of how, how it's grown, it's going well, what if we just created a community and that's us going, yeah, if that's if that's the the poll that I have, if I have a, a, a desire to see people connected, make a more pet friendly place for people to live, you know, that kind of sounds nice, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, we kind of might all want to see a little bit more connectedness going, you know, what's what's one way to do that? So I've I've really enjoyed getting to hear how you've put this together and, and the unique angles really of the the, the partners and the events. And, and looking at the education side of everything, too. Yeah, um, you know, it's just it's such a fun, interesting, unique model. And there's just so much to teach, so much we've learned from not only our members, our partners, um, but from other dog walkers, uh, pet sitters, pet pros throughout the country trying this model um, that we really feel confident that this is it's just a great way to do something more for your community than potentially what you thought was possible to help people on a level that maybe you thought wasn't even possible. I mean, uh, we've received letters from people during the COVID period uh, who said your, your club, your ability to connect with other people literally saved my life. You know, one woman said her husband had died during COVID. She mm. decided to adopt a dog dog became severely reactive doing during 
due to not being able to socialize. Um, and we were a lifeline for her. Uh, another woman who um, was just very mentally um, uh, depressed and just not sure what to do next in her life. Just these lifelines, these letters that I've gotten from people, I just know that there's something more there. and We're reaching people on a different level than uh, I think most of us will e will ever realize in our lifetime. So I, I highly encourage people to think about it and see if this is something that might be right for their community. And just to comment on something that you said there too, we actually take people through a whole exercise to see if this market actually exists where they are. Because we would hate for you to spin your wheels, do all this stuff, and then you're like, oh, well, nobody's coming to my events or nobody's coming to my group. We have a whole bunch of exercises that allow them to see if this is going to be viable in their area. Uh, well, I know we've talked kind of high level through a lot of this stuff, and there's so much more here. So, Tracy, how can people get connected with you, look at that guide, and start asking questions about whether this kind of model would work for them? Yeah, absolutely. So they can go to startadogwalkingclub.com or they can search for that on Facebook and come to our private community for pet pros where we talk about marketing and PR and all kinds of good stuff and how to uh, make this viable in their area. Perfect. Well, I will have that link in the show notes so people can click right to that and start learning more about this. Tracy, I am really appreciative of you coming on the show to talk about this and kind of how it's been structured and the unique aspects of this that it involves creating much more of a community aspect for the pet owners that we serve. So I'm so thankful for your time today. I know you've got a lot on your plate. So um, I really, really appreciate getting to talk with you today. Thank you, Colin. The honor was all mine. I appreciate it. There's no one size fits all model for you for how you want to serve your clients, or even for where you are serving them. Some models just don't work for particular areas or for particular niches of the market, and that's okay. The important part as a business owner is to be trying things, is to be experimenting. It's to continually iterate on your ideas and seek out input from others on their perspective. As you grow and adapt your business and change and adapt your business model, you will get connected with the clientele that you need to through your marketing efforts and all of that. Additionally, don't underestimate the impact that a business model can have on your mental health and your well-being. Some business models are way more grueling, way more intensive than others. Recognize that and understand that you can make necessary changes. We want to thank today's sponsors, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials for making today's show possible. And we really want to thank you for listening. Thank you so much for your time today. We hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. We'll be back again soon.